Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. Now, if you have any questions throughout the session, if you're joining us on Zoom, just look at the top of the bottom of your screen. Wherever your Zoom controls are, you should see a little button that says Q&A. Click on that, type in your question, and I'll get to those at the end. If you're watching us on YouTube right now, just feel free to leave a comment in the live chat, and I'll get to those. If you're watching after the fact on YouTube, just leave a comment, and we'll get to those when I can. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department the last 10 years or so, traveling around North America, helping techs and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on. So I had about 30 different franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they service in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic. And before that, it was eight years at Subaru. So worked in a dealership and over time, I guess, just became that default diag guy in the shops. So I always ended up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher cars that would come into my bag. And before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs. Been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. So our topic today is vehicle network communication overview and diagnosis. So this is a kind of an expansion of some of our other videos we've done, we actually had it split into two parts. And uh, network communications can be a bit of an issue, can cause a little bit of heartburn when you're out there trying to diagnose a, some sort of a communication problem with a vehicle. What's the problem? Is it a module? Is it a problem in the wiring? What What is the issue? And we may have to go in and actually tackle testing the network out. So let's start at the very beginning at base level. What is a network? So a network is a system that utilizes information through all available resources. So any of the resources that are connected together, uh, it is going to utilize information from that, especially on a vehicle. It could take a you know, speed sensor signal from the ABS module. It could take a gear position uh, data from uh, the transmission control module and uh, RPM from, a, from the ECM and, and whatnot. So it takes all that information, combines it together for, for whatever it needs it. Now, there's some types of networks out there that you may already be familiar with. Uh, so we have the LAN, which would be a local area network. That is going to be a bunch of different computers hooked up to the same network. So think of the Wi-Fi in your shop or just the router in your shop. That could be a local area network or it would be a local area network. And then a WAN, which is a wide area network. It's going to be multiple LANs connected together over a wide area. That would be a really convoluted way of describing the internet because that's basically what it is it's a bunch of smaller networks combined to make a larger network and then of course the types of networks we're going to deal with in the automotive industry we have can of course which is controller area network lin which is local interconnect network which is kind of a lower speed bus and then we also have the the new kid on the block the diagnostics over ip so that's actually using ethernet either internally within the vehicle which a lot of manufacturers do and some manufacturers also communicate with Ethernet to the scan tool as well. Uh, so we're going to have to deal with that, you know, being more prevalent as we go down the road. Now, all networks work on voltage differentials. So that there is a set range of voltage that a particular network would have to watch for. So in this case, this is a LIN bus. And what a LIN bus works on is a 12 volt differential. So from the top to the bottom, peak to the valley, we should see 12 volts or greater. If it's less than that, the computer might not necessarily even read the signal. So if it was maybe seven volts instead of 12 volts, it's not really looking for that seven volts. So it would just call it cause an issue and it wouldn't uh, wouldn't communicate in that case, throw a code and whatnot. Uh, so we're at, right here, we're seeing it doesn't go down to zero and the peak is at about 13.3. So we see 13.35 at the top. We see 0.91 at the bottom. That gives us a difference or the differential between the top and the bottom. It's going to be 12.44 volts in this case, which is more than 12 volts, which is where it works. So if you're trying to analyze a network, one good thing to know is what is the voltage range that this is supposed to operate in? So in this case, in LINBUS, and we'll look through a few different networks as we go through here. Um, Different network types work with different voltage differentials. So if we understand what voltage we're looking for, we can understand whether or not it's doing what it's supposed to do. So in this case, LIN bus 12 volts. 
And we have some low speed networks that we've worked with in the past. And I guess there's still variations of them around out there, uh, but mainly they're, you know, from the early days. Uh, J1850, which is a single wire bus, or it could be a dual wire bus, depending on how the manufacturer has it set up. We have variable pulse width, which is going to be the single um, single wire. And then pulse width modulate is going to be two wire bus. We also have a K-Line, which you may have heard of as well. Uh, a lot of Asian vehicles would use that. There's also a uh, L-Line that goes along with that. We have LIN, which is local interconnect network. So a lot of modules on vehicles nowadays use LIN. So it's kind of a master and a slave type control. Uh, we have CAN, of course, which has been around since, you know, mid, well, it's really been since the 90s, but it's been standardized in the automotive field since, uh, you know, mid-2000s. And then we have CAN-FD, which is an extension of that, which we'll talk about that because that's becoming more and more of a hot topic lately. We also have FlexRay, which is used in some vehicles, most, which is a media entertainment uh, network. And then, of course, we have Ethernet, like we talked about earlier, which also could be referred to as DOIP or Diagnostics over IP. Every module gets a little Ethernet, uh, you know, Ethernet connection and an IP address. So it works very similarly to, say, a home network. Also, we need to uh, understand, well, if we're going to be communicating with a vehicle, we need to start at where does the scan tool plug in? So that's going to be the data link connector. Now, the nice thing about a data link connector is that, by and large, the pins are standardized as to what does what. Now, we've seen some variations as we've gotten to uh, newer vehicles, 22s and 23s. I'm going to show you a couple examples of that. But uh, if we look at this, just uh, it's fairly standard DLC. We have pin one, which would be our low speed CAN communications ter terminal, which could be used. Uh, GM used this a lot in the early days as it was tr transitioning from uh, low speed bus to CAN. It would use a single wire CAN. Uh, we have J1850, pin two, which is the power uh, variable pulse width. Or if we have pulse width modulated, that's the positive side, which would be right there. And then the negative side would be right there. Pins 4 and 5 are always ground. Pins 6 and 14, that's going to be your CAN bus. So your main CAN bus on the vehicle. We'll see the, uh, why I say that man, main CAN bus in a little while. But the main CAN bus is going to be like your engine, brakes, body control module. All the major modules on the network on the main CAN bus are going to be terminated there in 6 and 14. There can be others uh, on split into different networks as well. Uh, we talked about K-Line, so pin 7 is going to be keyword or K-Line uh, communication there. And then we have the L-Line, which matches the manufacturer uses two, two, uh, two wires on that. It's going to be down there. And then pin 16 is always power. So if we don't have power there, that's got to be the place you need to start. So if you don't have power at pin 16, you got to start there, check fuses, check lines, make sure everything works. Because if I don't have communicate or I don't have power there, I more than likely am not going to have communication with the vehicle. So let's start with our single wire networks. We're just going to do like a high level overview here, and then we'll get more into testing on a little bit. So single wire networks are going to be like that J1850 that we talked about. So the J1850 variable pulse width going to be a single wire with a transmission rate of about 10 kilobits per second. So this is really kind of the slowest uh, network that we're going to deal with when we're talking about this today. It's fairly slow. It's older protocol, uh, that sort of thing. Now, J1850 variable pulse width uses a 7-volt differential. So you'd see a 7-volt square wave going across the screen. If you're looking at it with a scope. Uh, pulse width modulated bus is going to be a two-wire bus. So it's, the, uh, it's a, a variation on that. It's going to use the same type of communication protocol just going to be two wires and that's uh, considerably faster it's four times faster 41.6 kilobits uh pulse width modulated also uses a five volt differential so here's j1850 variable pulse width that is about a seven volt differential there and that would be on the older school gms would use this a lot uh, gm was a big fan of this other manufacturers i'm sure use it as well but that's probably the more prevalent one and then we have J1850 pulse with modulated, which would be more in your Fords. The older Fords would use this a lot. Uh, so they wanted to use a two-wire communication bus on that. Uh, once again, these older vehicles, very simplistic back then, too. They didn't have a lot of modules, so they didn't need a lot of bandwidth. So they didn't need a lot of speed. So they were fairly simple, laid-out networks. And you can tell just by looking at um, 
a wiring diagram, which we're going to look into four different examples of wiring diagrams here in a little while. Uh, but that's definitely where you want to take that through the wiring diagram. Uh, K-line, like I said, often used on Asian vehicles, 10.65 um, kilobits per second and a 10 volt differential. So even up through the mid 20 teens, for example, Subaru would use this. This is off my 2011 Subaru, and that's what they use for their factory scan tool, uh, can use uh, the K-line on that. Uh, it also communicates with CAN, but also K-line at the same time. Uh, depending on what module you need to diagnose on the vehicle. We'll take a look at that, like I said, in a little bit. But that is a 10-volt differential. So we got about 10 volts at the top, about zero volts at the bottom. See, it's pulling down the ground. And what and what are we actually looking at anyways when we see these square waves? It's ones and zero. Computer's only talking two words, one and zero, right? So uh, one, is, one is on, zero is off. And then depending on how many ones and zeros we have stacked together, so if, uh, if 10 volts was a one in this case, uh, we got a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of ones, and then a few zeros, and then a couple ones, and then a couple zeros. Depends on how long that is. Uh, and that's just going to be what's in that information packet. Now. Then we have LIN bus, which is also a single wire, but it works a little bit differently. So LIN was specifically developed to achieve cost-effective communication for intelligent sensors and actuators in motor vehicles. It is a master and a slave. It could actually be multiple slaves on the same bus. Uh, so we're gonna have a master, which could be say a switch, like a window switch. And then the slave would be the window motor up and down. So it just sends data back and forth in order to do that. Uh, another example I could think of is like uh, on an SUV, Chevy Tahoe, uh, the switch for the wiper, the wiper actually runs off a LIN bus. So you have power, ground, and LIN. That's all you have going back there uh, to that. Instead of having to worry about relays and all that, you're just sending a LIN bus back there and it's got power. Ground. It's used whenever the bandwidth and versatility of CAN are not needed. It's going to be, like I said, a very simple system, master and slave. It's going to be a single wire with a transmission rate of up to 20 kilobits per second. So it's a little bit faster than our J1850. But uh, in this case, like I said, it's just sending data back and forth between a master and a slave. The LIN uses a 12 volt differential in that case. So if I were to take a look at it with a scope, which we'll see in a second, it's gonna be a 12 volt top to bottom. A couple of different places where you're gonna find this on the on the vehicle is gonna be like say roofs, uh, you know, sun, uh, sunroof controls, lights, steering wheel, pretty much any vehicle nowadays, uh, any of the buttons on the steering wheel is gonna be working on a LIN bus, seat, seat positions, occupant sensors, engine, you know, doors, all the little things that don't necessarily drive the car down the road, more than likely you're going to find it on a LIN. We'll see how we can discern that. Then we have LIN, uh, typical LIN signal, like I said. So we're our ones and zeros once again, but this is, uh, this is off an alternator sensor on a Subaru again, and that ran over LIN. And that was a 12 volt differential. So it's a little over 12 volts, which that, that's fine. You know, you usually get a little bit of a buffer in there plus or minus, you know, 11 and a half would probably be okay, 12 and a half would be okay. Somewhere in there is gonna be, you know, it's gonna be a 12. Then we get to CAN. So CAN is probably more of the prevalent network that's out there. Especially nowadays, pretty much 06 and newer, <clears throat> give or take. 06 and newer is where they uh, started to transition to making it mandatory in the US anyways. Uh, over in Europe, I think it was a little longer. But high-speed CAN, basic high-speed CAN, is going to consist of two twisted wires with a transmission rate of between 100 to 500 kilobits per second. You have low-speed, mid-speed, and high-speed CAN. Um, CAN uses a 2 to 2.5 two volt differential. You'll see high to low. One signal circuit is going to be identified as CAN high, and the other cir circuit is going to be identified as CAN low. At each end of the data bus is a 120 ohm termination resistor between the CAN high and low circuits. And that's pretty much the stop sign, the end of the road. Here is a terminus uh, at the end of this uh, network. So if we wanted to oversimplify a CAN bus, and this is, like I said, is a way oversimplification, but really just to get to understand kind of how it works. So like I said, we have high and low, and then we have a 120 ohm termination resistor across. Many times, very often, 120 ohm termination resistor is going to reside in a controller. Sometimes it could just be a plug with a resistor in it. I know, for example, once again, at Subaru, 
uh, when you add in an accessory alarm to some of those, uh, all you would do is, is there was a sensor that you'd put underneath the seat and it would plug in on the CAN bus. And all you had to do is unplug the, uh, it was just a little like a loop. You unplug the loop, you plug in the module, bolt it down, and then you had to turn it on inside the body control module. It was just a simple program uh, of that. But you once you turn it on, then, uh, you know, it's ready to go. It's, it adds itself to the, to the network. So that is the nice thing about CAN. It is modular. So over time, I could add additional modules to the can. I want to add more modules. Sure, we can do that too. We'll add a few more in there. And then maybe you have to do a little setup. Maybe you have to do some sort of a relearn uh, or some other indicator that tells the vehicle they've added a module. But, you know, here you go. I can add it. You can also take them away. If I had just one module on the network, it's still going to be talking. It's still going to be communicating. Uh, and then I could have the scan tool hook up to that. And then when your scan tool is on the network, also remember this, when your scan tool is plugged into a vehicle, it becomes another module on the network. So when we're communicating data, that's how it reads the data is over that network. And if I were to look at it on a scope, and we're gonna take a, a, a little bit closer look to CAN specifically a little bit later, uh, when if I were to take a look at it with a scope, it's gonna look something like this. So these are my data packets, my ones and zeros, multiple ones, multiple zeros, and we can see how we kind of have a high and a low. We have a high side and we have a low side. And then we have an idle state in the middle, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. Now, one of the hot topics nowadays, especially, is CAN FD. So CAN FD is, for all intents and purposes, it is CAN. It's going to work pretty much the same way. The data structure is a little bit different. But as far as testing it, as far as you know, communication-wise, it's going to work pretty much the same structurally anyway. So CAN-FD stands for Controller Area Network, which is CAN, and then FD is Flexible Data Rate. So it has a, a variable data rate that can you know, go faster or you know, to the same speed as CAN. Structurally identical, like I said, it's going to have a twisted pair of wires, just like regular CAN, 120 ohm termination resistors on the ends. The nice thing about CAN-FD is I can use CAN modules and CAN-FD modules on the same network, and they don't care. They'll talk to each other. Uh, due to the data structure, though, it can carry more data and faster. Now, anywhere from three to eight times faster than traditional CAN was what I was able to find. Um, so could be anywhere up to uh, three times faster to be 1,500 kilobits per second, up to eight times, which would be 4,000, uh, I guess. Yeah, 4,000 uh, kilobits per second. So considerably faster when it needs to be. And they use these, by and large, on the types of things that need higher speed or higher higher throughput volume of data. So things like cameras and electric vehicle controllers and things like that uh, is really where it's going to use. So uh, not to get too in the weeds in here, but uh, basically it's going to be uh, the data is going to be pretty much the same uh, data length code. We see that goes in there. Eric communications is going to have a couple extra bits in here. Uh, to tell it what to do. Uh, another one's the bit rate switch. That'll tell it how fast it's going to go, different bit rates. Um, but, you know, you, you you don't need to be an electronic engineer to, to understand what I'm visually seeing on the screen because you're really just going to use the scope and you're going to see the different bits go by and you're going to see is it short of power, short of the ground? Is there something missing? We don't really care what's inside here unless I'm actually going to code some some things, program things. I just care what does the data look like? Is it clean? Is it working? Is it communicating? Now, when it comes to CAN FD and scan tools, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of stuff out there going on, a lot of noise, I guess I could say. Uh, so there's some companies that sell adapters, CAN FD adapters. And uh, uh, they say, oh yes, for 18 and newer Ford and GM vehicles, which, you know, great, well and good. But if you live in North America and or, you know, over in the UK, at least, I'm not sure about the rest of Europe, but US and UK, you're not going to need it to communicate with the vehicle, at least at the, as of this time, as of fall 2023, winter 2023. There are no vehicles in these markets that require CanFD to talk to the vehicle. Now, Latin America, South America, you know, pretty much the Mexico border south. There are some vehicles that use CAN-FD to the scan tool. 
and uh, I actually got a message from a franchisee one day, and they're like, hey, they, this is I, this customer that they're trying to use their scan tool with the car, and it's asking for this adapter that it doesn't have. Uh, and I said, okay, well, what's the car? And it ended up, it was a Chevy, uh, I don't remember what kind of Chevy that is, but it's a, it's a Chevy that they only sell down there. Um, Onyx, Chevy Onyx, that's what it was. So they only sell it down in Latin America and South America. And that is can FD to the to the tool. Now, in that case, depending on what tool you have, you may indeed need an adapter in order to communicate with the vehicle. Now, as far as this, as far as snap on tools are concerned, of course. But Apollo D9, Triton D10, Solus Plus, and anything with the S9 scan module, so Zeus Plus or a Zeus with the S9 scan module, you don't need an adapter. It's going to work perfectly fine. It's going to it's all built in on the chip hardware that's within the tool. Now, if you have, uh, so that's any of the current tools, current generation tools, I should say. So Apollo D8, Triton D8, Solus Legend, Solus Edge, Modus Edge, any of those tools that came out prior to uh, Triton D10, I guess would have been the first of that other bat. So any of those, you know, last generation tools, you would need an adapter cable. So if you've ever seen the Ethernet adapter cable, it looks just like it, but it's a different color. That's the only, the only difference between it. So it's got that big pill in the middle of the cable, and that has all the you know chips and such that are needed. But as I said, if you're in North America and UK working on North America or UK vehicles as of right now, there are no vehicles in those markets for those markets that require CAN FD to communicate with the skin. Instead, if something gets over the border, all bets are off at that point. But um, you also can't identify a Chevy Onyx with the scan tool with North America software on it either because it's just not it's not even there it's not a vehicle that's available in the market so it's not available to select on the tool so I don't know I don't know what happened in that particular situation I assume it just came up for Mexico but because it was a uh, it was a dealer in Texas so but anyways as of right now not really an issue but if it does you know happen where the, the manufacturers come up with it and say, hey, yeah, we're going to communicate with the scan tool this way. Then we got you covered because all the all the stuff's already there in place. It's just we don't need it right now. So uh, I took an example from, uh, like, say, a 2023 Mustang Mach-E. It does use um, CAN-FD in the vehicle. So we see CAN-FD right there, CAN-FD right there. But when I communicate with it, these wires here, I am only communicating over CAN, regular CAN. So, like I said, CAN, CAN FD, they can play nice together on the same networks, or I just use a gateway module in this case. Uh, so, uh, this has Diag CAN, so it's just communicating over CAN. I don't need an adapter for this because all of the CAN FD is within the view, not outside of the view. Next one up is going to be FlexRay. So, FlexRay is even faster than uh, the, the CAN or CAN FD for sure. Now, FlexRay bus is used uh, a lot of European cars, so like BMW uses this for sure. Uh, I'm sure other manufacturers do as well. The FlexRay bus consists of two twisted wires. Once again, it's very similar to CAN physically. It's got a transmission rate of up to 10 megabits per second, which is way faster, uh, and uses a one volt differential. One signal circuit is going to be signal high. The other one is signal low, so it's going to be very similar to CAN in that way. At each end of the data bus, there can be anywhere from an 80 to 100 ohm termination resistor. I guess there's a little bit of flex in the in the um, uh, standard for that. And then, like I said, it's going to be between the high and low, just like just like on camera. And if I were to look at flex ray on a scope, it's going to look more like this. So I have a lot of much smaller ups and downs going on there because it's going to communicating considerably faster on the network. So these little bumps and these little ups and downs are the ones. Now that brings me to gateway modules. So for data to be sent between networks in a vehicle, like a high-speed CAN or a low-speed CAN or single wire and dual wire, Ethernet, whatever, I need to translate. So that's where we use a gateway module. Now that's not to be confused with a secure gateway, like on a Chrysler vehicle. They can maybe use the same job. Sometimes they might do the same job uh, with that transfer as well as having security in there but they are two different two different uh, ideas and thoughts another way to think about it is these modules are the router on the vehicle's network so if you wanted to be able to communicate with different functions different modules high speed low speed you need a uh, gateway module 
So this example is a phone call I got one day and I had somebody call me and say, hey, I can't communicate with the engine on this vehicle. It's got to be my scan tool, right? It's always, always quick to blame the scan tool, not that quick to blame the car. And I always say, well, why is the car in your shop in the first place? It's not because it's working correctly, right? Because it's a problem with it. So I'd be more apt to blame the car first, scan tool second. But anyways, he said, oh, I can't communicate with the engine. I said, well, can you communicate with anything on the car? So they went through module by module, and sure enough, they couldn't communicate with anything here. So like the ECM, the TCM, um, uh, let's see, electronic brake control module, power steering control module. But they could communicate with all this stuff, the lower speed stuff, like the radio and the uh, SRS module and the HVAC module and so on, anything on the low speed bus. So I pulled the wiring diagram and I looked and it's sure enough, there's my DLC right there. So low speed goes in, high speed goes in, and then it translates as to where that needs to go. So we sussed out that none the information wasn't making it through the module. So therefore it needed a module. And in that case, it was the body control module on this vehicle. They replaced the module, set it up, all good to go. And then... Um, we're also dealing with considerably more speed on these vehicles now. And we're going to take a look at one of these network maps in a little while. Uh, but GM, they announced May 20th, 2019. So that was a, a four years ago now. But it debuted in the 2020 Cadillac CT5. And it's in most GM vehicles by now. I'm pretty sure it's in pretty much all of them. But they called it the GM Digital Vehicle Platform. Because there's so much data going around vehicles, we need to be able to transmit that data faster. So it's capable of processing, processing four and a half terabytes of data an hour. That's a lot of data. And that is a five times increase over the previous, which is Global A, which was nine years old at that. Utilizes Ethernet communication internally, not externally, doesn't talk to the scan tool that way, but inside the vehicle, 10 gigabytes per second, up to 10 gigabytes and also offers over-the-air updates. So it, is, it can do remote updates on the vehicle just simply over the air using LT. So that is out there, and there's other similar technologies across manufacturers that are out there. So let's talk about testing. So now we kind of get a, a rough understanding of you know, how they work, voltage differential, different voltage ranges. How am I going to test? It? Well, as you saw previously, we do need a scope in order to test the network integrity. You're not going to be able to test it with a meter, that's for sure. You can't do it with a test light, that's for sure. They just don't react fast enough. And test lights is just going to maybe blink, but it's not really going to tell you anything. Uh, I need to see visually what does this look like. Is it short to power? Is it short to ground? Do I have glitches? Do I have noise? So uh, we want to use a lab scope. Any lab scope will work. High fairly high sampling rate lab scope, but it, you know, as long as I can get down to microseconds, at, a, at you know at, at 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 least microseconds we should be able to do that um, we can test it at the dlc that's the easiest place to test it's going to be at the dlc as long as we get access to it from there uh, recommend to use a breakout box to lessen pin damage i don't want to front probe that dlc i pretty hard pressed to back probe the dlc we're going to start at 10 volts as a scale because all of them work within that range and then i'm going to set the sweep time to 100 microseconds and go from now, here's an example of a breakout box that we have. We have a couple different varieties. There's a bunch of different ones out there from different manufacturers. But what it's going to do is it's going to plug in to the DLC using this cord. And then each one of those pins, of course, is each one of, uh, represents one of the pins on the DLC. And then I have another DLC here to communicate with the scan tool at the same time. Some vehicles will not display a pattern at the DLC unless it's communicating. So if it's just sitting there idle with the key on, you might not see anything because it won't make it through the gateway. So I have to try and communicate with the vehicle in order to get that or get that data flowing back and forth. So once again, when you connect a scan tool to the vehicle on the network, it becomes another module on the network. So we just have to, if we have a communication problem, that's where we're going to suss it out. And what we're going to look at it, this will be a rough animation of pretty much what you're going to see. You're going to see the data packets going. In this case, we're looking at CAN. Uh, so you'll see the CAN data going back and forth. Uh, depending on where your trigger is at, if you don't have a if you don't have a trigger on, it's just going to kind of skate by. If you do have a trigger on, it should be able to hold it. What we're really concerned about is the high side and the low sides. So the high range is going to max out at about three point seven five. Low range is going to max out about one point two five. Anywhere in that range, 
we're okay. So when it's idle, we should see about two and a half volts on both sides. Now this is CAN bus, like I said. When it transmits data, it goes up by about a volt, volt and a quarter, comes down by about a volt, volt and a quarter on either side. And then we go back to idle. So like I said, we're only interested in those thresholds. I want to see no more than 3.75 or so, no less than 1.25 or so. Anywhere outside of that, it's going to be considered a problem. So here's an example of noise. So I see a lot of noise going on, and you would see this on the screen. You'd see a lot of hash and, and whatnot, look like static. And uh, that would indicate a problem, EMI. Uh, the network is still going to work, but whatever controller is causing an issue is going to drop off, and we're just going to stop talking to it, and then we'll get you. Uh, if the packets are weak, that would be an internal short to ground. That's probably one of the more common issues with a CAN, is inside the module gets, gets messed up. So uh, it's shorting it to ground. It could short it entirely to ground, or it's just going to shunt some of the voltage away, so I get a weak, uh, weak signal. So in this case, the high side, we see it could be shorted to power, normal, or shorted to ground. Other thing uh, on the low side could be shorted to ground, normal, or shorted to power. Both can be shorted to ground, both can be shorted to power, both can be normal. Or one side shorted to ground, one side shorted to power, any variation in between. And then here we are, uh, irregular packets up and down. In this case, we're shorted to ground. We can see it glitching the ground here. Um, and in this case, this is all over the place, up and down, all around. If we have the wire itself shorted to ground, we can still communicate on the one wire. It just shorts at a, it goes at a lower frequency. Uh, same thing with the low side if it's shorted to ground, uh, entirely to ground. Or if both sides are shorted to ground, it's probably damaged. The lines are probably damaged. So we would have to look at it. Different bus problems we can run into. Here's a case study, an example of bus problem. It's an 05 Silverado and it had an intermittent hardship. There was no rhyme or reason to this hardship. Uh, act like it was in, when it had this problem, it would act like it was constantly in third gear. So it would really take a long time to get going from a stop, like I started in third. It was a manual. Comes and goes at random, could be hot, could be cold, could be driving for five minutes, an hour, didn't really matter. It was just a random occurrence, uh, no rhyme or reason to it. So we hooked up a scan tool to check the codes. It was a uh, turbo diesel. We go into code scan. And then we pull the report and two pages of codes. On this. Mostly U codes. There was a couple C codes in there, but it was mostly U codes on this vehicle. And in this case, you know, we have lost communication with the transmission, lost PCM communications, class two data link problem right there so that is a generalized code so we went in and checked a few things it's going to say well it could be anything any of these modules could be causing the issue with that uh go through and it says conditions for setting the dtc a note a live message has not been received from an unidentified module in the last five seconds after establishing data communication so um this means that it did not get a status message the, you know, the, the modules on the network haven't heard from this particular module uh, at some point during the communication. When that happens, the module is going to use a default value for the missing parameter. So we could have substitute values in there if it's looking for RPM, for example, or shift point or whatever it happens to be. It's going to just say, all right, we're just going to throw a dummy value in here just so the vehicle can go down the road. Uh, so we go through and get to the flow chart on this. It's going to say go to the DTC codes for possible information when it does have a code. First one there is 101 that came up. So we plug that in. And once again, it's going to say um, periodic message didn't uh, hadn't been received. So we go through the flow chart for this uh, system check. Yes, I checked all the systems. Saw a scan tool. Was there a DTC 0073? And then also it says check for positive voltage, negative voltage, whatever. All I did was, uh, well, let's just hook up to it and see what the network looks like. And it was a single wire network and it looked like this. In this case, this was single wire can on this. It was kind of an older older uh, module scheme on this. And you can see it looked kind of like that. That's bad. It should be a square wave. It should be square at the top, square at the bottom, and it should be getting down to about zero volts, seven to zero volts. In this case, 
is a uh, single wire can J1850, kind of like a weird hybrid on this vehicle. Uh, but we can see you got high line of seven, low line of zero. In this case, it doesn't even make it to zero. And in this case, it does make it to zero, but it takes its sweet time getting there. If you ever are looking at something that's supposed to be a square wave, this, pulsive modulation, uh, fuel inject, any of those types of things where it's supposed to be squared off, pulling the ground, and it's not, the front end of it's taking time, that is indicator of a bad ground. It's taking a long time to get to ground because remember, it is a voltage over a time. So it's getting there, but it's taking a long time to get there. So that is indicator of a bad ground. Over here, it doesn't even make it. Uh, so if we have a bad ground, we want to test it. We want to take modules offline is what this says. So go through your different circuits, pull things off that aren't communicating. So in this case, we had a special tool that unfortunately is no longer in production. But this is called the data bus fault finder. If you can ever find one of these and you work with network issues, this is a very helpful tool. for you. So what it does is it checks the bus for uh, source to power, source to ground. And then it gives us, um, let me rewind that a smidge right there. So it tells us, is the module connected, which are these green lights? And then is it short to power or is it short to ground? In this case, we have this one, this one, and this one short to ground, which is pulling the bus to ground. So we looked at the network configuration here. In this case, it has what we call a star connector there, a joint connector there. And all the modules go to the central location. And it ended up being the TCM, the PCM, the BCM were the ones that were shorted. So all you have to do on this tool, like I said, this is a very helpful tool in this case. All you do, got to do is press that little button. It takes it offline. So if I press the button and the pattern gets better, then I know that whatever module is connected to that line is the bad one. Otherwise, we have to go around and unplug. It. So unplug it. Did it get better? No. Plug it back in. Unplug it. Did it get better? Yes. And then uh, we would see that. So in this case, this is uh, we just went sequentially through here. When we got to the transmission, it got better. So you can see good square tops and bottoms. So in that case, we understood at that point that the TCM was bad. New TCM was ordered, installed, and set up. And then we check back to information to verify the repair. In this case, we go down, double check it for you know, any codes, any codes in there, no codes, perfect. That's it, all done. Uh, so it ended up being a bad TCM. Now, the, the problem with codes, the U codes in this case, is that they don't always give you a good direction when it comes to U codes. A lot of times it can be cryptic, the work, uh, workflows can be cryptic. So just understand that U codes don't always tell you exactly what the problem is. So let's go live and take a look at a couple things we're going to talk about next week here. But let's go look at a few things. So as I said earlier, when I'm testing a network, any network, first off, I want to understand what kind of network it is, and I want to understand how it's linked. Best way to do that is a wiring diagram. So we're going to go through four different types of vehicles. First one's going to be this uh, old school Jeep Wrangler. It's a 2005, and that is going to have a fairly simple network. I'm going to pull up my wiring diagram in my repair information. I'll give it a second here. Go, call it a four liter. Okay, pull up my wiring diagrams. And in the case we have Shopkey or Mitchell, it's called computer data lines. Other other uh, you know, wiring diagrams might be called something different. It's only one page, very simple. There's only what? One, two, three, four, five, six modules on this vehicle. There's the DLC. And we can see each module, except for the PCM, the PCM communicates with multiple lines. Or we have the instrument cluster, which is uh, one line. We have the, send, uh, the skim module, which is another line. They, they all kind of go off this PCI bus, but it also has this SCI bus as well. So we can see it's pretty much single wire point to point. And then that's how the network runs. It's just a bunch of splices in between different modules. Uh, so we can see all that in there. And it's a fairly simple network. If, it does, if this module doesn't work and it doesn't communicate, check for the wire and see if it works, see if it's transmitted. You know, it works out fairly simplistic when it's uh, when it's that easy uh, of a layout. It's one, it fits all on one page. There's only six modules. It's not going to be that difficult to suss out where the problem. We get a little bit newer and a little bit differenter. 
the Forester that we looked at before, my car. So if I pull this up, remember how I said that um, on Subaru, even through the mid 20 teens, still used uh, K line for some of their manufacturer specific um, data, but it also has CAM on this. So it's kind of like a both. So we go over to the DLC. We'll see we got 14 and 6, right? Red and blue. Come on. Why are we not highlighting it? Oh, it must be. So I got 6 and 14. And if we look, the first place it goes, actually it goes a couple different places. So it goes into the ECM, the rec, and then it taps off and goes into these other modules here. So we got the red and the blue wires everywhere. So we can take a look at that and we can see how they go to all the different modules kind of in series. And then it also goes into this joint connector. So this CAN joint connector, what this does is this gives us a, uh, a testing point. A lot of vehicles have this somewhere on it. Now, the funny thing about this one is it's on the left side of the dash right above the fuse blocks. And these joint connectors in there look like fuses. So if someone were to not quite understand what they were doing and they just pulled things at random, they might kill the network on the vehicle. Just so you know, that could be an oops that happened. Um, but it also gives us a testing point. So I can see, well, if I can communicate, well, let's see, it comes from the DLC and it goes into ECM and it goes into these modules here and it goes into the body control module. So if I can't communicate with, say, the AC, the NAV, or the combination meter, which would be the, the speedometer cluster, uh, if I can't communicate with those, the first place I'm going to look is in here. So if I can communicate with the body control module and nothing past that point, I'm going to, first place I'm going to look in. Um, so just understanding how the network lays out, because it is kind of like a daisy chain in a way. I mean, these splice off in the same place. So it's kind of like a parallel, series parallel, I guess it would be. Uh, but the different sensors all run off the can. Now it also runs, let me close this and read it. I said it also runs a K line. So that's uh, these purple wires here. So we got this joint connector in here, which gives us another central point to test. So that goes from the DLC and it goes individually point to point to each module. So that's like a point to point type scheme. Now we say it doesn't go to these two and it doesn't go to all these over here. So what it's going to do is it's going to go into the BCM and then from the BCM, it's going to communicate out on CAN bus to all the other ones. So there's just kind of, you got to kind of look at it like a map. Here's where we're going to look on the individual vehicles, the individual modules. What am I not communicating with? And what am I am communicating with? What am I communicating with on the vehicle? Good way to find that out too is by doing a code scan because it's going to tell you whether or not it's communicating. So that's the Subaru. Now let's look at something a little more fancy. That Mach-E we looked at a little bit earlier. Remember how I said it's got can FD? inside the vehicle. So we're going to come in here, load this up. Let's just say it's a GT, I guess. And we'll pull up the wiring diagrams. And we have the computer data line. So this has five pages of wiring diagrams. But we can see, if we go down to the bottom, you can see there's the DLC. And it's going to communicate over 6 and 14. Four and five are ground, and then we also have three and 11, which would be on a different bus. So if I take that and look, we have diagnostic CAN one, diagnostic CAN two. So we have CAN one positive, CAN two positive, CAN one positive, negative, CAN two negative. And we also notice on this gateway module, it goes right to the gateway first. Remember how I talked about the gateway being a router. On this car, we can find one, two, three, four different pairs of ethernet, mid-speed CAN, High speed CAN FD. So I have CAN FD on this vehicle, but it's internally. So if I'm looking at this CAN FD, let me refresh this one again. So if I'm looking at CAN FD, what connects to the CAN FD on this vehicle? So we can see that goes up to image processing module. So that's the camera, uh, secondary onboard diagnostic control module. And if I go across the page, it's going to come over here. And it's going to go into things like vehicle dynamics control, PCM, uh, 
let's see, evac and fill module, power steering control, driver status monitor camera. Oh yeah, by the way, that's another ADOS thing. So that is monitoring your face to make sure you're paying attention to the road, not falling asleep, ABS module as well. So as I said earlier, the manufacturers that are using CanFD, at least domestically, US, North America, uh, they're using it on things like ADOS. They're using it on things that need higher speed, but still want to be able to use CAN on the vehicle. So that is internally, like I said, not communicating with the scan team. And then the last uh, vehicle we'll look at real quick before we look at a couple more things. It's going to be the Silver Auto 1500. So this has that new Global B network configuration on here or platform. The GM digital platform. So if we go in here and pull up the wiring diagram on this, 13 pages of wiring diagrams, by the way. And if I look at that DLC, that DLC is full. Every single pin on that 16 pin DLC has a purpose. And it's mostly to communicate with the vehicle. So we can see we got different CAN buses, Ethernet buses, um, private serial CAN buses, Auto Star, which I think is their diagnostic bus. All goes to a gateway module first, and then it goes out to the rest of the vehicle, right? So we're dealing with gateway modules on most vehicles now. Whether or not they're secure or not, that's going to depend manufacturer to manufacturer. But in this case, every single pin on that DLC is used for some sort of communication bus to the vehicle. So I can access it there. I can also access it at the gateway level. Now, what if I want to learn additional information about, say, CAN bus, flex ray bus, whatever? If I have a snap-on scan tool with guided component tests, which would be any of the tools with a scope, I can go in here and there are classes. So if I go into how to under classes and I go down, it's the first 20 minutes. Let me a CAN bus. Basics and fundamentals, bus arbitration, voltages, error handling, signal quality, waveforms. If I wanted to see what bad waveforms look like, there's a good one. There's one where one is open, high side's open, uh, low side, short, positive, high, both are short, high, positive, and so on and so forth. So it gives you all sorts of different configurations that you can see, and it's going to tell you how to look, how to look at it, where to test, and then what the voltage is. So we can see that right there. I could also go in here and pull out my scope and I can test it this way. I got to turn on my simulator. There we go. Now, like I said, we want to set both channels to 10 volts. In this case, I'm set to 10 volts on channel one. I have to turn on channel two because I know I'm looking at can right now. All right, I got 10 volts. Now, 200 milliseconds, that's going to be way too long. That's why we can't see anything. Better. Let's go from 200 milliseconds. Remember how I said we had to go to maybe microseconds? Let's go to 200 microseconds. There we go. There is a CAN bus message. And this is just a simulator, of course, but we can see there is my data packets. And then there is, at the end, we have a larger packet, which we'll talk more about in a minute. But that is a good example of a known good CAN bus pattern. There's roughly where I'd want to set it up, about 200 microseconds, 10 volts on each. I can also, if I have a snap-on scan tool, I can pull up that actual vehicle. Let's see, 328i. And if I go into guided component test, most vehicles with a CAN bus are going to have a separate CAN bus component test under engine. Pull up a signature test. In this case, it tells me I want to connect at the uh, computer itself, and it's going to tell me where. It's going to give me a known good uh, picture. It's also going to give me all this information here. I click on it. There's my, it presets the voltage, it presets the time. I don't have to worry about doing that. I don't have to worry about memorizing what it is. In this case, it sets up to 500 microseconds, which is fine. And then I can see my positives and negatives. Does it look like this? Yeah, it looks pretty much like that. We're in good shape. Now, some manufacturers, you're not going to see this on every manufacturer, this um, high voltage on either side. Some manufacturers have it set up this way, some don't. So in this case, BMW does, and this is what we call an ACK bit or an acknowledgement. So what I like to think of this is, this is the period at the end that it's set. So I'm going to go through all my data. This is my bit, uh, chunk of data. When I get to the end of the chunk, there's the end, and it said acknowledgement. Bit. Yes, I acknowledge that I'm done, or I've acknowledged that I received. So that's what that is. So you may see that every once in a while, depending on the manufacturer. Don't freak out if it's over there. 
it's always going to be at the end. If I see something like that in the middle, then maybe I have a problem with the short. But in this case, it's at the end. So we know that's an act and acknowledge. All right. So that is our quick and dirty 45 minute can and network class. So there are other videos on this topic that we have on our channel. There's other videos on this topic. There's many, many videos out there on this topic. That is quite a hot topic out there in the industry because, well, communication problems can just be. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about next week. Adding to our diagnostic difficulties, so to say, we're going to talk about security link. So this is how we access secure gateways on Snap-on tools. So security link, are you ready for the new OEM security protocols? We'll talk about a couple of different manufacturers, what they're using now, how we're going to set it up, where we're going to put our information. It has to be in a couple of different places. And then we'll, we'll also maybe give a little bit of a preview as to what's coming very, very soon down the pipe. So if you want to catch that next week, same time, same place. If you want to watch on Zoom, go to snapon.com slash OT, 6 and 9 Eastern every single Tuesday. Uh, 6 p.m. class also goes live to YouTube like we're doing right now, youtube.com slash snapon diagnostics. Please like and subscribe if you are watching on YouTube. And uh, if you want to check any of the other videos out, it's available there. Also available at 9 p.m. Eastern, I go to my Facebook page. So it's facebook.com slash snap on Jason. Go check me out there if you are on Facebook. If you want to see any of the other um, topics in this series, anywhere from intro to ADOS down to hybrid vehicles, there's 77 different episodes available on YouTube right now with, of course, more to come. Next year, we're going to be uh, adding even more. We have a new series that we've come up with, so we're going to be talking about. Quite a bit next year, we're going to get vehicles or manufacturer specific on some of these classes. So, hey, let's just talk about Ford this week. Let's talk about Nissan this week. Let's talk about BMW this week. That's kind of how we're going to do. We're going to do a lot of the classes next next year like that. We'll add in some other stuff, too. Uh, but that's kind of a thought going down the road for at least next year. Uh, so definitely stay, stay, stay tuned for more of that. Yeah, we'll get the questions here in one second. Let me just make sure I mention my buddy Keith, who also does free training. We do free free training three nights a week here at Snap On. Uh, on Wednesday and Thursday, though, Keith does diagnostic tool specific training. So on uh, Wednesday, it's on Zeus, Zeus Plus, and on Thursday, it's on Apollo and Triton tools. One class a night, seven thirty Eastern, six thirty Central. They're about an hour and a half long or so. Uh, so the first hour is going to be setup functions. Let's talk about Security Link. Let's talk about Snap On Cloud. And then he goes through, um, you know, code to completion, fast track intelligent diagnostics. And he takes about a five minute break, goes through uh, scanner, I mean, scope stuff. So your scope, your meter, you got a component test, all of those functions in the second half. That's after a five minute break. Like I said, very thorough class. He's been with us for over 30 years. So he's very deep well of snap on diagnostic tool knowledge. Definitely worth your time if you want to get a little bit more hands on training with one of those tools. Snapon.com slash OT to register there. It is Zoom only just because it is designed to be kind of a more intimate class, I guess you could say. You can ask questions, get them answered, that sort of thing. All right, let's go to Q&A. Uh, I got one on Zoom here. Let's see. All right. So Jay Lee Lobo, I guess is how you would say that. Uh, they say on Zoom, hi, Jason. First time live on Zoom. And from now on, I'll be here every time I can. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, learn a lot from your classes and knowledge. Very grateful to learn from you. Just purchased a Zeus Plus today with your workstation. Congratulations. I uh, appreciate that. If it is your first Zeus, you might want to go check out uh, Keith's class as well uh, on Wednesday nights. So just to get your get you know get your feet wet without how to navigate through there. So on YouTube, uh, we got Keith says, hello, I want to say thank you for your classes as well as the update for the new software. Love the addition of the ECM pinouts in there. Excellent. Good deal. And Nick from England is checking in as always about 11 o'clock at night over there. You are the night owl, sir. Definitely. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Come spend a little bit of time with me. And that is a good segue to my last slide. Thank you very much, all of you, for taking a little bit of time out of your day, spending a little bit of more time with me, learning about uh, network and how networks work and how we can test them and how we can investigate them uh, when we have those network communication problems. Hopefully you'll join me next week for uh, Security Link, and we'll talk more about secure vehicle gateway modules, things like that. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week until then. Enjoy your weekend. Have a nice night and take care.